Good evening, everyone. It's so so good uh, to see so many so many people here. My name is Edgar Rodriguez Dorans. I am a research, the research officer for the Staff Pride Network, and I want to thank you all for being here for the second event of the Staff Pride Network Research Seminar Series, which will be of interest to scholars working on LGBTQIA plus topics. We hope that this endeavor helps to connect researchers at all stages of their careers working in the field. We are going to have seminars like these all year round, a winter seminars, spring, summer, autumn, uh, all year round. And for the latest, I, I just wanted to say that for the latest news of the Staff Pride Network, you can visit our blog to see our up upcoming events. You can also visit Eventbrite and you can also follow us on, on different social media channels like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or you can also join our mailing list. I'm going to put the link with these details on the chat. So if you are interested, you can, uh, you can join us there. And tonight, I want to introduce Dr. Dora Jandrik. She is a researcher in sociology, and she obtained her PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Her research interests include the intersection of sexuality, time, and aging. And her PhD thesis explored how older same-sex couples imagined their future. She worked on a project which investigated experiences of invisibility of bisexual employees in the UK and currently works as a senior tutor on undergraduate level sociology at the School of Social and Political Science here at the University of Edinburgh. And Dora presents tonight a talk entitled Imagined Futures of Older Same-Sex Couples in Scotland. The talk will be followed by a space for questions and comments. So now I will invite you to listen to Dora. And Dora, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Edgar. Um, I will just share my presentation so everyone can see it. OK. So thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. It's very uh, exciting to be here and I'm looking forward to the Q&A afterwards. So my name is Dora, uh, as Edgar mentioned, I have a PhD in sociology from the University of Edinburgh. And tonight I'm going to talk about my PhD research uh, in which I explored how older same-sex couples in Scotland imagined their future, how they thought about aging and what role the past and present had in this imagination. So to start with, I would like to give an outline of the seminar. So firstly, I will provide a brief outline of the research context that actually drove me to do this research and then a bit of a historical context of the participants' lives because as I was looking from uh, their past to their present, the historical context in which they grew up was uh, really important and you'll see why. Uh, after that, we'll move on to the research questions, which I will just kind of lightly touch upon. I don't want to go into too much academic discussions uh, tonight, but if anyone has any questions later on, we can definitely address them. Um, after the research questions, moving on to methodology, just to explain what I did, how and why, and uh, basically then showing you some data, which is always, for me at least, the most interesting part. And then I'll end with the contributions, uh, some conclusions to my research and kind of what I plan to do next. So beginning with the research context, uh, when I started thinking about doing a PhD, I actually wanted to do a project that concerned the representation of older people in literature. So my master's degree from Croatia is in English literature. And I just finished a seminar in aging and it was all very interesting. So while I was preparing this presentation or well, proposal, I realized that there was a very big gap on research on the aging LGBTI community. 
So that kind of led me in a direction to explore this more and obviously straight away from literature and more into a sociological context, which was a completely new area for me. So it was very scary, uh, but you know, it ended up well. Um, another thing that was really driving uh, my research in particular was this erasure of the older population in general from the stories about the future. So there is this very prevalent negative stereotype of older people not belonging to the future because of their age, their health, their deteriorating mental or physical state, um, that they cannot contribute both economically or in some ways uh, even by procreation to the future of their nations. And just kind of to illustrate this, if you Google older couples, um, these are the pictures that you get as top search results, which not only show the kind of the heterosexual norm of aging and coupledom in later life, but also don't really represent the variety of the aging experience because not everyone looks this good or probably feels this good or is able-bodied or has this perfect smile uh, when they reach older age. But nevertheless, they are still happy and content in their relationships. So this is something that I try to do with my research to show that there are other ways of aging and that aging is a subjective experience and that there isn't one single proper way in which people uh, have to age. Now, moving on to the historical context of the research. Um, so I was looking at people who were over 55. Um, this was because during the last 40 years or so in the United Kingdom, there have been a lot of uh, really important events for LGBTI equality. Uh, some of them we can see here. So the first photo represents campaigns against Section 28. Uh, and I'll mention Section 28 in a bit. And the second one is uh, when equal marriage uh, passed as law in uh, the United Kingdom. So the historical context of the research and of, of these participants of, of the couples that I talked to was framed by heteronormative norms. And just for those who are not kind of familiar with, with the term heteronormativity is the idea that heterosexuality and opposite sex coupledom is the only proper way to form a relationship. And, you know, you can't have children unless you're in, a, in an opposite sex coupledom and the heteronormative uh, couples, as we've seen in, you know, the older couples that I showed you just uh, just then, that's a clear illustration of this heteronormative older age. However, the problem here also begins when these norms are translated into the legal framework. Uh, and this was the case in the UK when up until 1980 in Scotland, engaging in same-sex relationships for men was a criminal offense and they could be prosecuted. And it was also until very recently that homosexuality was considered a mental illness so something that can be cured uh, through different types of therapy, which I will touch upon through the stories of my participants. Uh, another aspect of this kind of heteronormativity spilling into other areas is through education. So Section 28 was brought about by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in 1988, and it prohibited uh, promotion of sexual homosexuality in schools and it also framed same-sex relationships as unacceptable family relationships. So you can imagine that some of the people that I've spoken to were, you know, were in front of this bus, were at the forefront of campaigns against Section 28, and you can imagine their happiness when it was finally repealed in 2000 in Scotland. Finally, even after homosexuality was decriminalized, uh, there we had a very big problem with the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 80s and the 90s, which then further added <clears throat> to the stigmatization of men who have sex with men. And they presented, they pushed kind of the, the, the things that were won and but till then back a step saying that, well, you know, this is what happens if you engage in same-sex relationships and in, in sexual intercourse and behave in this way, which was obviously, as we know now, uh, not true. Thankfully, uh, things changed and things are changing and Scotland is a very good example for this. So I made a little timeline of kind of all the positive things that have happened, which we hope will continue. So as I said, starting from the decriminalization of homosexuality, 
in England and Wales in 1967. It was repealed, sorry, it was decriminalized in Scotland 13 years later. And while some might think of this as, you know, what was Scotland waiting on, it was the case of Scotland wanting to have the, the act of decriminalization completely transparent and covering all aspects um, that some of the English acts didn't cover. Finally, uh, I think things started looking up really in Scotland after the devolution of the parliament in 2000. And at that time, section 28 was repealed and abolished in Scotland. And it was only abolished in England three years later. So there's still this time difference. And in 2000 uh, as well, openly LGBTI people could serve in the armed forces in Scotland. Following this, we have a couple of acts that have increased equality. So we have the Civil Partnership Act in 2004, the Adoption and Children Act um, in Scotland in 2007. There's also the Anti-Discrimination Act in 2010. And then one of the biggest victories for <clears throat> this com community, uh, the Same Sex Marriage Act, which again has its own uh, criticisms, but it's something that I didn't really, some of my participants addressed this, but it's not um, kind of the, the point of my research. Finally, the kind of the final two, the most recent uh, events that happened are the Ellen Turing Act in 2017, where, post, where a posthumous pardon was granted to gay men who have been prosecuted uh, because of their sexuality. And there was a very emotional and nice apology delivered by uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, if anyone remembers. And then finally, to show that 2020 is not all that bad, uh, same-sex marriage was introduced in Northern Ireland. So those are some of the positive um, things. And in my research, I focus particularly on the aspects of the Scottish side. So the, the events that happened in Scotland to um, increase equality and uh, inclusivity of the entire LGBTI community. And now there's still work uh, going on about on the transgender community and the intersex, uh, but we, uh, we can kind of go back to that uh, later on. Um, now, just to briefly kind of guide you through my research questions, they are very academically led. And so, you know, I'll try to explain them, but we don't have to focus on them too much just to see what kind of what I did. So I had an overall, an, an overarching question that asked very simply, how do older same-sex couples uh, navigate the intersections of sexuality and aging in imagining their futures? Which means how is their sexual identity and their age, how do they feel about the aging experience? So is their sexual identity something that they are aware of as their age? Is their age more prevalent? How do these two things combine in thinking about the future? Um, I also had three sub questions, which then helped focus um, the project. So what is the connection between the past, present and future in the couple's narratives of their imagined future? So I will show this later on. There is this very strong link between the three times um, in that as we think about, you know, well, past, present, future kind of linear, but through the stories that I've heard, it's very clear that the perception of time is not linear and the way we talk about time is not linear. And as much as the past can impact the present, the present also creates the past. And I will show you this in some uh, examples. The second was uh, how do interpersonal, collective and imagined relationships feature in the couple's narratives and what is their role in imagining the future? So there was a lot of talk about the partner's relationships to each other, but also an imagined relationship to the Scottish community. So half of my participants were actually from England, uh, but they felt Scottish. They felt like they belonged to the Scottish society. They felt very welcome and they felt this link um, to the community here. And then I'm, I was looking at how these relationships that they formed throughout their lives uh, basically created their identities and how they will go on in the future. And then <clears throat> the final question that I addressed was how do themes of historical time, generation and sexuality appear and intersect in their accounts? So this is similarly to kind of the, the, the overall question, looking at time as it is objective, uh, we can call it. So years in which something happened and then the years in which the participants were born and grew up and then their sexual identity, how do those three things mix basically to create um, how they think about their future. 
So moving on to uh, what I did, I used semi-structured joint interviews. So I will unpack this. Um, joint interviews meaning that I interviewed both uh, partners together. So there was no separate interviews with each uh, partner. And I did this on purpose to get a very deep uh, account of their relationship. So I wanted both of them to create uh, the story of their life together. Semi-structured uh, meant that there was no strict interview schedule that uh, we had to follow. So I had an overall kind of topic guide that I wanted to, to discuss with them, but the couples were free to talk about whatever they wanted. And this provided a very rich set of data, but also it gave the couples power over the interview process. So they were deciding what they want to talk about and whatnot, which is very important in uh, researching vulnerable populations such as older people or sexual minorities. Um, in between the interviews, so I did two interviews with each couple, I left the couples a notebook in which I asked them to write or draw or there was even a poem in one instance about how they imagined their future. So these accounts were produced by the couples in their own time. Uh, I gave them usually between four weeks and two months, that was the kind of the timeline, and I came back to them in the second interview, and then we talked about what they wrote. And what was interesting in this way of collecting the data is that some of the things that the participants shared in the accounts were not shared in the interview. So there were different sets of, of stories that were shared in different ways. Um, and as I said, so my participants were same-sex couples in Scotland. Uh, at, length, at least one partner had to be over 55. So to ensure that there was this knowledge, maybe even not first-hand knowledge, but the contemporary existence of the people and the events that I talked about. Um, and I just want to <clears throat> put a disclaimer here that by saying you know, that I'm doing research on older couples, uh, 55 is by no means a cutoff age for being old. But as you know, if you've ever done academic research, you know that you have to categorize and justify and explain all the decisions that you make. And 55 is often used, especially in stories about jobs, employment and retirement as the cutoff point. So that was you know, just an arbitrary number I decided to go with, which then worked in my, um, in my favor to include all these experiences. So my final sample was seven couples, 14 participants, and the age range was from 36 to 77. Um, what was interesting that the younger couples, sorry, the younger participants, so there was a man who was 36, but his husband was 63. So the, the participants on the younger end usually had um, older partners and the older participants were closer in age in, in their relationship. So there was this, diversity of experiences from, you know, people being there repealing section 28 to people learning about it in schools, which was uh, very interesting. Okay, now moving on to the, the interesting bits or, you know, the illustrative parts, I'm going to talk about the findings, so the data and the stories that I've heard. Um, as an introduction, some of the key points that we're going to see here and that I will come back to are, Kind of that the experiences from the past impact the participants' lives in the present and their imagine, imagination of the future. And then, as I said, the perception <clears throat> of time is not linear and that the participants had two ways of imagining the future. So short-term future and long-term future. Short-term future is the future that will happen when we are alive. So in, in all of our lives, we kind of when we imagine, we can also divide this future into two ways. And the long-term future is the future that happens after we die. Um, this is not my idea. This is um, from someone else, but I think it really nicely represents the stories that were that were here as well. And finally, uh, a completely very kind of surprising and new aspect, which is always what you're looking for in research, is that all the couples imagine Scotland as a utopia. And that was something that I wasn't expecting. Um, and when I started, so that was a very big bonus towards the end. Okay, now starting from the stories of the past and the present. Uh, now I'm saying, you know, we can't look at time in a linear way, but we'll look at the data chronologically just to make it um, easier. But I will show you how it links all together. 
So Fred, 67, he's now married to uh, Robert, who is uh, 76. And he says that we were talking about participation in my project, because I said, you know, it's really difficult to get older people to um, come and talk to me. And he said that, well, obviously, you know, one of the problems is that gay people of our age, we will over we will or <clears throat> we were all brought up at a time when what we did was illegal. So, you know, even though Scotland now is more inclusive and open than it was 30 or 40 years ago, there is still a fear among these people who lived uh, during the times where, as Fred says, you know, we don't hold hands in the street because if we did that in the past. It could at best lead to talks and at worst, you know, we could be prosecuted. And Fred actually, he came out in the 1980s and he calls himself a masochist because of that since it was a very turbulent time. He lost the job, uh, he lost his accommodation and someone made false uh, accusations against him. So police was involved as well, just because he came out as a gay man. Uh, and this is obviously reflected in his uh, behavior today. Uh, Robert, his husband, uh, was married to a woman at one point, and that is a very common narrative in older LGBTI people, especially with women, which I will, I will show you in a bit. So Robert, looking at this marriage from the present perspective, says, you know, I knew I was gay, but I was kind of hiding away from it. And this was probably because his immediate family and his immediate society was expecting of people of men and women to engage in opposite sex relationships, to follow this trajectory of you get married, you have kids, you get a job, you retire, and then you die. So, you know, there's this normative line that people are expected to follow. And then, of course, if we want to fit in, we fit in by, uh, as Robert here did, getting married to a person of the opposite sex. But then he said, you know, I really had to face it when the marriage came to an end. So at the point in time when he did it, he pretended hard enough to pass as straight and to become normal uh, in the sense kind of heterosexual. But now he says, I'm, I obviously know why I did it because I was hiding from it and I knew I was gay, but it wasn't acceptable. Another interesting example of this story about wanting to be normal is from Jeff. So Jeff had a very, um, emotional experience. And when I heard it first, it was quite difficult to kind of process it. So he said that when he was 17, he uh, moved to a bigger city. And uh, the first weekend he was there, he was raped by a man. And at that point, he said, you know, I didn't want it, but I absolutely enjoyed it. And that created a lot of conflicting emotions within himself. And as you can see, said, I then had to spend the time discovering what on earth it was that was so fantastic. But I was also very unhappy. So that led him to actually go to the doctor and the doctor recommending uh, for him to do aversion therapy, which uh, is just another example how uh, homosexuality, especially being a gay man, was perceived to be a mental illness or something that can be cured by enough um, therapy. And Jeff ends it on a positive note and had and says, you know, it had no effect on me whatsoever. So it's it's good. He, you know, he's able to laugh about it today. But <clears throat> when he was seventeen, when uh, uh, this was still going on, probably wasn't a laughing matter. So uh, aversion therapy and this idea of homosexuality being a, you know, being able to be cured is something that is translated today in the narratives about being normal. So Jeff is now married to a man, Alan, and they keep referring, they kept referring in our interviews to themselves as being just like another heterosexual couple, or we're just like everyone else, we can be married, we can be the same as everyone else. So it creates this desire to belong to this majority of people, which obviously is not wrong. And there are theories that there are two kind of groups of LGBTI people, one that is fine with belonging to the majority and then you know, equal marriage comes into play here as well. And then the other that is 
uh, more radical and going against it. So that, that's another discussion, obviously, but it was really, really visible here. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the stories that the women shared are, were a bit different than the stories that the men shared, because uh, for women, it wasn't criminal to engage in same-sex relationships because nobody thought it was possible. So uh, some of the participants uh, here said that, you know, I had no idea that two women could be in a relationship. I had to look up the word lesbian in a dictionary when I first heard it. Um, but still, it was this realization that something was different. And as Rachel said, you know, I was so afraid. I knew it was criminal for men. And I know it wasn't criminal for women, but it was just such a fear. It was such a gripping fear that I couldn't come out. And she was 58 at the time of our interview, which was um, two, three years ago now. And she's still coming out to people, even though she's in an open lesbian relationship, but both her and her partner say that, you know, you never stop coming out, basically. It's, it's a daily, daily thing. And this was also um, reflected in, sorry, Jane's story. So Jane and her now partner, Sarah, were in a very similar situation, both of them. So both of them were married to men and had children when they realized, you know, um, something, something was happening. And Jane says, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't come out and make anything, uh, any, couldn't do anything that would make my children unhappy. And there was this idea that wives should be, uh, women, sorry, should be wives, should be mothers. And if you do anything to disrupt that, you could be ridiculed and kicked out of your family. And, you know, she had no role models. Nobody else was in a position uh, like she was. And, you know, she just thought, I'll forget it. And in the end, she did come out, obviously. And she said, you know what, my children not only survived, but they thrived. They are so happy that I'm in a loving relationship now that it was, you know, I, I was afraid for nothing. Um, so Sarah, her partner, and Jane now work actively to advocate for equal marriage and to allow women to kind of, to support women coming out and to... Uh, provide any type of counseling that they might need, which I think is a really good way of using possibly negative experiences from your past into something positive in the present. Okay, now <clears throat> moving on to the short-term futures. So these stories concern mostly health, care. Um, they, they ended up with death, uh, just kind of timeline-wise, but there was a big fear that surrounded the short-term futures that the, that the couple shared. So Fred and Robert here discussed care homes and private care. So thankfully, as Fred says, you know, in Scotland, affording private care shouldn't be a problem because Scotland offers um, free personal care for the elderly. So that's good. So they could stay in their own home for as long as uh, possible. But they say, you know, if we want to, if we need to move into a care home, we want to be together. We don't want to be separated. And then Robert says, being separated in care, I regard almost as a fate worse than death, which is, you know, it just makes you think how difficult it is for some people to, to imagine having something so, so simple, just, you know, needing care or professional care and looking at it in this, in this kind of way. Uh, another story about care homes was from Jane and Sarah, who talked about being, uh, you know, too demented or not being able to tell the care staff that they don't want to be put in dresses, they don't want to be given perms. So this is also very stereotypical, stereotypical of how older people are supposed to look in care homes. But it also says something about their independence and the way that they dress as reflecting who they are. So this was also shared by another female couple who said, you know, I only wear jeans and trousers, but if I go to a care home, I know they're going to put me in a dress with flowers and I don't want that because that's not me. So there is this fear of completely losing one's identity, not only identity as, uh, as a lesbian woman in this case, but just stripping down a person to a number. <clears throat> um, and one of the ways in which some of the couples tried to maintain their independence or talked about maintaining their independence and control was through assisted suicide or euthanasia. So some of them hoped that euthanasia would be legal by the time that they need it. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing 
going on in the UK or in Scotland in that sense. So I'm, I'm not sure that they will live to see it. But Sarah and Jane had something that they called the Blue Pill Day. And it was a day uh, in which they kind of thought about their living circumstances and decided whether or not they will end their lives together. So um, I, you can see my response is, well, you know, I, I'm not sure how that goes, but wouldn't it be difficult to find a, such a pill? And Sarah is very confident. She's like, no, 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 I have medical background, you know, we're, we're fine. And we came back to this in the second interview because I, I really wanted to know more. And they said, you know, it is something that we actually do every year, but it's not always in our mind. So it's a way out of a society that might not understand us or if we feel cheated or if we don't get the care of if we're if we're separated you know um it will only be the case of are we strong enough to literally put the pill in our mouth which i think <clears throat> was a very strong image of how strong these people wanted uh to keep their independence and i mean everyone wants that finally uh the long-term futures were more positive so uh, these stories were about hope and trust uh, and Scotland as a utopia. So Gloria here, uh, this is a part from the written account actually, and she writes about the children in her life. So Emily, her partner, her children and grandchildren somehow make the future seem a more real place. So Gloria talked about when she imagined the future, she only sees this dark cloth and can't really env envisage what's going to happen. But when she thinks about the kids, she thinks about, okay, well, you know what? They're gonna be happy. They're going to be good adults. There is, the world is going to go on with them inside. So she's actually using children as extensions of herself in the future, even when, she, even when she's not um, around, when, when she dies. Um, Rachel and Kathy also talked about how in the future there will be a need to continue the fights that have been going on so far. So uh, as Rachel said, we can't sit back on our laurels and think we've won, sorry, they should say we can't, not we can. Uh, so we won some battles, but we haven't won the war yet. And it's not enough for us to kind of relax and say, okay, well, we have everything that we wanted, so who cares? Um, and all of the couples share this. And this is, I think, very strongly going against the stereotype that older people can't contribute to the future because not only are these couples contributing to their future. So um, Emily, who I mentioned just in the previous slide, she was 77 and she still campaigned and uh, had asylum seekers in her home when they were waiting for their papers to get sorted. So she was still fighting the good fight. And not only that, but these couples were the ones who made the present possible, the, the present situation that we can see now. And so I think this really goes to show that it's not as easy to sign off the older generation as people might think. Um, finally, uh, the fight for equality wouldn't be possible without a supportive political environment, which was something that all couples agreed on. And Alan says here, you know, we have two LGBT leaders, two parties, and as a gay couple, we feel safe. So our future in this country is safe. And this importance of representation of LGBT rights in the parliament means so much for him and for um, Jeff that they feel you know, completely at ease with their lives, despite of what happened up until now. Uh, they feel that this will be, that Scotland is the place to be. And this is reflected in <clears throat> kind of Jane and Sarah's discussion about the first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who is uh, who has shown support for the LGBT community on numerous occasions. And as they say, you know, it's incredible. It's so supportive. It's been amazing. Um, another interesting thing about this is, as I mentioned, some of the couple, some of the people were from England. Um, but all of them put a lot of trust and hope in the Scottish government. So Emily said, Emily called uh, actually Nicola Sturgeon our fearless little leader. And she said that she was like a terrier who bites and doesn't let go. So when she wants something, you know, she's fighting to get it. And it's this idea that Emily felt so comfortable being in Scotland and so welcomed by this country that she immediately said, you know, she's our leader. It's not Boris or whoever is down in England, but Nicola is 
is who we look up to. Okay, now uh, going back to kind of the key points that I mentioned at the beginning and based on uh, what I just showed you, these are some of the main ideas that um, I kind of found in my research. There, there are more, but these are the, the key things. So uh, obviously past and present experiences impact how people imagine their future um, and not only how they imagine it, but how they create it. So uh, none of these people want to see the past repeated and that's why they actively participate in campaigns, in um, being activists, uh, working with Amnesty International, for example, Stonewall and all these other organizations to make the future a better place for younger generations. And that <clears throat> ties in then into this idea that older people do have agency in the construction of the future. And just because, you know, maybe some of them are unable to work or unwilling to work uh, or contribute economically, there is so much that today's generations own them in terms of the past that is so easily forgotten that we have to keep um, our mind on. Um, this imagination of the utopia that is Scotland is based on what we know and what are surrounded with. So utopias aren't imagined or created out of some weird idea of this ideal place. It is actually taking the good things from where we are and, you know, uh, kind of making them bigger in our imagination. So all the things that the, the, the couples shared about Scotland will go into another direction. From Brexit, we will have independence, we will not be isolationist or xenophobic. That's all based on their experiences with this country so far. Um, and then finally, the long-term future was more optimistic in the couple's imagination, as they've shown. So the short-term future was based on their fears and expectations of health and care services, which was a combination of what they've heard goes on in such settings, but also there is still um, discrimination present, not only for the LGBTI population, but for the older population in general. And some of the fears uh, stem from their past experiences. You know, if we look back to Jeff's stories and his experiences with doctors, it's clear to see why he would be distrustful of um, professional medical staff. So just before um, I finish, I would just like to mention briefly something that I'm working on at the moment. So I'm, I'm currently applying for fellowships to do my own research. Um, and this research would be a project that would in investigate or explore uh, LGBT, the LGBTQ plus population in Croatia. Um, <clears throat> so this was kind of brought about when I was actually doing my PhD, I found quite a lot of parallels between Croatia and Scotland. And I think in terms of LGBTI equality, Croatia today is what Scotland was 25 years ago. So there is room for improvement. Some things are happening. Um, hopefully the future will be better. But I also think that Croatia's recent history with uh, the war and uh, independence, also the independence referendum, uh, will be interesting to see how older LGBTI identities exist and develop through these times. And basically the end goal of this project, if it goes through, is to strengthen this international uh, research on LGBT high aging and to raise awareness about the population uh, in a setting that's not uh, doing much to um, protect its most vulnerable groups. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Dora, for, for this really enlightening talk and sharing your research with us. Um, I know I, I found it really interesting to have uh, these uh, individuals and a uh, couple stories uh, told through your presentation. Um, so uh, with that, I think now we have uh, time uh, to, to ask uh, all of our participants if they have any questions or comments or uh, observations uh, that, that they would like to make. Um, I, I think, uh, Robbie, if, if uh, the best way to do this might be if, if people are either uh, happy to log their, uh, their queries or comments in the, in the chat function, um, 
uh, or if, if you're happy to uh, turn on your your uh, video um, and, and ask your question directly. Um, I'm not sure, Robbie, do we have a, a raise hand function on, on Zoom here? Um, yes. Well, we, I'm just sorry, I'm just checking. I don't think we do, do we? No. No, I don't sorry. think there's one on Zoom. We do have, we do have, you can, you can put your, oh God, you can put a yes. We have, we have responses. So you could put a yes in your thing if you have a question you'd like to come to and we'll come to you in order. Or you can just shout over each other at the moment because there's not. <laughs> it's probably easier than trying to figure that out. <clears throat> so I I guess if if I if I'm okay to uh, start off with one question uh, I had and um, just kind of reflecting on uh, one of the the, the images uh, that that you shared with us um, initially in your presentation uh, when you said you googled uh, old people and the, the two images uh, you shared with us didn't really uh, show a lot of diversity there. And I, I was just wondering um, uh, if, if you've come across um, either uh, kind of during your research or uh, following your research, if you've uh, come across any particular examples of uh, um, successful aging for, for same-sex individuals, just uh, Noting that that successful aging does tend to focus on on uh, heteronormativity, heterosexual mm -hmm. couples. Yeah, thanks. That's very very interesting, and especially because I part of my research was actually a critique of the successful aging concept in itself. Mm. Uh, uh, because I agree with you, it's it's a very kind of heteronormative concept and it's, it works around this idea that you have to be in great health, you have to have strong social connections, but it also works in having strong family ties which are based on opposite sex couples mm. and having children. Um, so through the stories, there is some research done on kind of successful aging on uh, older LGBTI people, but it's mostly a critique and saying, as I'm saying as well, we need to look at it differently. We can't apply this framework. First of all, the framework doesn't work even for a general older population because mm. it, it searches for this ideal of aging. Um, so I'm arguing that we need to take both the subjective aging experience, but also the historical and the social context of people's lives, and then to see how people age and basically just let them you know, let them age. We can, we can, yeah. It, but we shouldn't prescribe how people should age. That's that's kind of my idea. And Edgar, do you have uh, uh, a comment there? Do you have a? Is there a hand raised there? Yeah, I think he's clapping. Oh. <laughs> I was just clapping for that uh, for that comment. Uh, yeah, for yeah, everyone should be able to have this agency to uh, mm. self determination to yeah to decide how they age or how we age. Um, I think there is a question uh, in the chat. Yes, I yeah. think we've got a couple of of uh, questions in in the chat. Uh, just looking at this uh, from Laurie. Uh, they're interested to hear whether there were any reflections on younger relatives who have come out as queer. Um, you mentioned in one of your stories, I think, uh, Emily's, uh, Emily's daughter, um, who, um, who was, uh, who was uh, in the process of adopting two children, I believe. Yeah, yeah, with her partner, yes. So um, that was actually really interesting. So not all of the couples that I've spoken to had children. So I think it was six out of 14 of them had, uh, so six participants out of 14 had kids. So um, in some couples, both partners had children, in some only one and in some, none of them. So 
In uh, Emily's example, she had a queer daughter and I think a queer son as well. And Sarah and Jane had five children among them. And I think that four of them came out as queer. So, and I was really looking into, there's very little research on this. And I was really looking into, you know, does it mean something that if your parents are in a same-sex relationship, obviously doesn't kind of dictate that you should be queer or, or come out as well, but does this environment create such a positive and, and you know, neutral ground for coming out that it's easier and it's, it's more acceptable. So that was something that I was uh, really interested in. But then on the other hand, we also had, uh, I also had a, a woman whose daughter was fine with her sexual identity, but her son was working in the military and she almost tried to justify, you know, oh, it's kind of a, a boy's world, he's macho, so he doesn't really understand this, so I don't talk about it as much. So there was a lot of different experiences with, with children and um, younger relatives. There is a, a cousin actually of Jeff and Ellen who was coming out as, as gay and they were very proud that they could help him and guide him through this process and so on. So from the point of view of the participants, they were very supportive to, to both their family and other people who needed it. But sometimes they didn't get that um, in return, which was you know, unfortunate. Hmm. That's, that's very interesting. And thank you very much, Laurie, for, for that question. Um, I'm just uh, trying to keep up with the, the, the comments here. I know Esteban, you've uh, mentioned here uh, two, two queries. Are, are, um, are you happy for me to just uh, relay these uh, to, to Dora? Yeah. Um, so Esteban asked us uh, 55 uh, um, in, in very commas, old enough uh, for, for addressing aging here. Um, and secondly, what, what is the relation uh, between uh, your qualitative sociological research and the other ones uh, made on psychology? Um, I guess if, if, if you take that kind of uh, one, at, one at a time. So, so I know you, you mentioned in, in your uh, discussion uh, selecting 55 as the, as the age, uh, because in, in undertaking your research, you, you, have to, um, you have to be quite prescriptive um yeah. but i i guess it, it, in your experience it, it, do you think 55 is uh, old enough for, for addressing aging well i think you know if we think about it like that we can start i mean we start aging as soon as we're born which is i know it's a very general simplified idea but um i think it is i think based on on what i've seen i think 55 was just a good cutoff point where people started to think about uh, retirement, you know, plans that they need to make for later life. Um, but also, I mean, if you look at other literature, as I said, uh, there's, so the World Health Organization, I think puts older age at 60, but then you have literature on sexuality that puts older couples at 40 which is, you know, 15 years lower. Um, so actually my idea of 55 was from a paper written in the 70s by Bernice Newgarten, who says that people between 55 and 75 belong to the so-called uh, young old group. And they are categorized by being both in employment and out of employment. So you have this variety. They are usually free of um, familiar family obligations because their children are grown. They have a financial, a stable financial situation. And after I've done my research, I actually saw that this applies almost perfectly to my participant sample. So that's why I also kind of stayed with that. Um, but it depends on what you want to um, see, you know, if you want to, to look at the, the so-called third age, you know, people over 80 or 90 and how they experience uh, aging, then obviously you would need to go with an older sample. Um, and the second question, so I'm afraid I'm not familiar with research in psychology that much, but um, as far as I know and what I've done for this research, uh, firstly it stands among this kind of LGBTI uh, sexuality studies and aging studies really well because there's not much done about it, but then also it goes into 
um, studies about the future, which was another key kind of element. So if, you know, asking about positioning my research, it can go, I think, in, in at least two or three different areas in sociology. And uh, I, uh, thank you very much for, for that, Dora. Um, I, I think we have a, another excellent question uh, from, from uh, Laurie here. Uh, so did any of the participants um, uh, that took part in this study discuss uh, LGBTQI plus communities that they were uh, perhaps part of uh, over the years and how, how those uh, communities evolved? And maybe uh, that may have uh, affected their view of their future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And they did. So a lot of them were active members of different communities. Um, there was talk about, you know, it's a shame that this bar isn't open anymore, because this was our place where we would go and make banners and create this, you know, community of, of like minded people. And some of the couples actually met on protests, which was also interesting, or in pub quizzes in pubs that were uh, just for the LGBTQI plus community. Um, <clears throat> so now there's, there is optimism about these organizations. So especially um, LGBT health and well-being was one of the, the main ones because of their work around mental health, actually, which was, uh, which is becoming more and more prominent today. But the problem was that if you have an organization like that, most of them are very centralized to Edinburgh and Glasgow. So the highlands are completely empty of any kind of structure in that sense. And that was a, that was a problem for the participants who lived further out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think their belonging to, the, to these communities and their participation in them definitely affected their view of the future because they you know, explicitly talked about as long as we have this government, we're going to be fine because this government supports the work of these organizations. Um, so as long as nothing changes, uh, this will be, you know, a good place uh, in the future. Hmm. And yeah, I mean, one of the participants was one of the kind of founding members of one organization, which due to confidentiality issues, I cannot mention. But, you know, for him, it was, that was his life. That was the, the battle that, that is never ending. Uh, so it is definitely something that's, a very big part of their lives. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think we've got a, a, another question here. Um, Sinead uh, mentioned that, uh, found it interesting that, that uh, you're referencing family as biological family and the, the question there uh, being, did any of the participants have uh, perhaps non-nuclear versions of, of families? Um, or uh, they've they've specified not non-nuclear but um, almost uh, a, a chosen family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's absolutely. Uh, I think one of the positive things about this sample was that none of them had experienced alienation from their family. So that's something we see today uh, still happening, especially with younger people who then are getting kicked out of their homes. And then there's this whole problem of, of homelessness among LGBTI youth. Um, fortunately, the people that I spoke to, even though we might expect it being, you know, I don't know, 1970s, 1980s when they came out, you kind of think the older generation might not be as understanding, but actually they were even more understanding than some people we see uh, we can see today. So I did ask them about support networks specifically. So if your family is not able or you don't live close by, do you have a, a kind of a support network? I didn't use the terminology chosen family because I didn't want to kind of put words in their mouth. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but all of them had a group of friends or even just the next door neighbors who were, you know, they are here for us no matter what happens. This was in very practical terms. Uh, but in terms of kind of belonging to a wider community, it wasn't necessarily limited to the LGBTI community. So they were, they felt they were part of obviously that community, but also the community of their uh, peers, maybe in age or in kind of general, as I said, the Scottish um, 
the Scottish population. So yeah, it was, I, I honestly expected that there would be much more chosen families and support networks than good relationships with biological families. But thankfully I was proven wrong. And especially, you know, as I said, the kids are, were mo in most cases were very supportive of their parents and uh, were happy that they came out. Yeah, I think I think uh, that's that's definitely a really uh, interesting interesting uh, uh, finding from from your your research, um, and probably one that that, that um, wasn't as easy to anticipate, but certainly uh, a, a positive a positive finding to 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 um, to bring from that. Um, I'm conscious we're we're just uh, approaching uh, seven o'clock now, um, but if anyone had uh, any any final uh, final uh, questions they, they'd like to ask before um, I, I hand back over to to uh, Edgar just for his final comments and uh, to talk about uh, the, the next upcoming uh, in our research seminar series. Um, is, is there anything else anyone would like to ask? Maybe I can ask something. Yeah. <laughs> Did you find anything about, I, I was thinking about single people, people who are not in a relationship. What about them? Okay, so I, as I didn't talk to, to single people, I can't really, you know, advocate for them. Uh, but I think it's, in, in some cases, it might be a more difficult situation. I know some of the, some of my participants talked about, um, people who were obviously belonged to the LGBTQI community, but didn't come out and they had no support. So they, they were, they, or they did come out and they were completely alienated from their family and friends, or they didn't come out and didn't have anyone. So, and this was the, mostly the case uh, when I was in the Highlands because of the distances, people couldn't socialize and couldn't find um, support in, communities or, or in some organizations. So um, I really, I think part of the research that I want to do in Croatia will focus on single people as well um, to hear those stories and maybe some future research might come back to Scotland and, and look at single people's, older single uh, people's experiences just to, to see, because you know, all the things that I'm saying are just kind of ideas that I, I think might emerge but as this research has shown me you know don't expect anything and i think that's the beauty of it yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. um thank you very much dora it's been a, an enlightening talk and a refreshing one i was so happy to to see positive positive views on the 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 scottish context it was it was very refreshing to see that and um I just want to, to thank you again for accepting the invitation to participate in this. And um, uh, there are, oh, there are more comments there in the chat. So you can see from, uh, from, from the comments that it's quite, uh, that it, there is a quite positive response there. Yeah. Thank you, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really, really heartwarming. Um, no, um, yeah, I got lost reading the comment. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us in this second event of the Stive Prad Network Research Seminar Series. Please keep in touch via our social media channels. And thank you, Dora, for this fascinating talk. And thank you, Robbie and David, for your support in uh, like running the event. And, and thank you, um, uh, all participants. And um, keep an eye on the social media channels and the Eventbrite uh, page of the network, because we will be advertising the, the following events and the following uh, seminar se the seminars. And um, well, thank you very much and, um, and good night. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>